Good, that's started. So this evening, I'm very pleased to welcome Mother Melangeth from the skeet of the icon of the Mother of God of Unexpected Joy in Walsingham. Having spent time in other monastic communities, Mother Melangeth was asked to go to Walsingham, and you may well hear a little of her story uh, as we go along. The history and continuity of monasticism in Walsingham is extremely important, including in the Orthodox tradition, but Walsingham is also a place where many different Christians come together in their love for the Mother of God, and Mother Melangeth will be covering this aspect in her presentation, as well as the importance of Walsingham for the Orthodox community in the UK and throughout the world. And I'm pretty sure we've got some attendees who are from outside the UK, so it truly is a global um, place of interest. After the presentation, which is going to be a combination of speaking, some recordings and video, um, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So please do um, put your questions in the chat as you think of them so you don't forget um, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, just for those of you who are not familiar with um, uh, Zoom, there is a chat button at the bottom of the screen if you're accessing via laptop or um, a computer. And if you're on a um, smart device like a phone or an iPad, then uh, you might have to tap the screen to access chat, but then you'll be able to put in your questions. Um, we've got, had some thank yous from our charity representatives in the chat already, so um, it's great to hear from them. But do remember to put your questions in for Mother Melangeth about the presentation today. Now, I'm going to ask Mother Melangeth to unmute herself and begin her presentation. Thank you and welcome. Um, good evening to you all. Um, I feel a bit daunted by speaking to you because I can't claim at all that I'm an expert about Walsingham. I've lived here for about almost 12 years and I only find it seems like yesterday that I arrived. Also, my presentation is maybe not as beautiful as others do it because I'm not very good with all the computer skills. So I hope you will bear with us. But let us start off with the conduct of the, uh, to the icon of the mother of God of Walsingham. And I will start with a very, the usual opening through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us. Amen. Mother Melangeth, um, I don't think I can hear the Kondak. I wonder whether you maybe didn't press the share computer audio when shared screen. Right, I will try again. Could you see the pictures? Yes, I could see the pictures, just not here. I don't know what to do. Um, probably you'll need to um, stop sharing and then share again and make sure you tick the box that says share computer audio. Bear with us everyone, these are very... I do apologise. Share computer sound. Oh, I do apologise. Optimise screen sharing for video and share. I will do it again with my sincere apologies. Ooh, 
Sovereign and Lady, Mother of God and ever Virgin Mary, Thine own and thy family set up in the village of little Walsingham, granting unto us comforting times of trouble and as a wellspring of joy, so that with faith we may ever cry out unto thee, rejoice, thou who art full of praise. All right. Now the presentation consists of different things, and the first one will be Tim McDonald, who will be speaking to you. And um, he, I will show you the clip and that will explain everything. Let me now introduce you to Tim McDonald. He happens to be my neighbor and he also is the archivist of the Roman Catholic Shrine. He has prepared a talk for us, so at some point our faces will disappear and you will hear Tim talk about the Catholic Shrine. I don't know if Tim, before he starts his talk, would like to say a little bit how important Walsingham is in his life and what it means. Um, I have worked in Walsingham for 30 years and I came here well no, right. I've worked here in Walsingham for 30 years and I came here at the age of 40 so I'm now 70 and I was the Master of Ceremonies at the Catholic Shrine for 25 years and also I managed the Shrine and various other tasks so I had it has meant so much to me when I first came here. Um, I had a bad time and I came here and Our Lady took care of me and I vowed that I would stay here and do her work in this place, which I've managed to do and I'm now semi-retired, but I do, do keep working at the Shrine as archivist and um, various other jobs as they come. I see. So Our Lady got hold of you and never let you go. She did. I initially came just for one season in <laughs> 1990, and I just didn't go home. <laughs> she, well, yeah. This is another example of what Our Lady of Walsingham is like. And now we will go to the talk of yes. Tim. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mother. I'm sorry, I'm moving things that I don't want to. I do apologize, you can see that I'm not good with it. Catholic Walsingham begins obviously in 1061 when Richelvis had her vision and continues through to 1538 when the shrine was destroyed during the Reformation. After 1538, Walsingham virtually slept. Nothing happened here uh, from either point of view pro from the Reformation through until the uh, beginning of the Oxford movement, really, and that was in the 1830s, 
And then in 18, sorry, in 1829, the Catholic Emancipation Act was um, passed through Parliament and the Catholicism became to be accepted in a very small way. The area of Walsingham was at the time, once we had the uh, restoration of the hierarchy and dioceses and parishes developed, Walsingham was in the parish of King's Lynn, which is um, 27 miles away from Walsingham. The parish priest in King's Lynn, Father George Rigglesworth, and a, another priest called Father Philip Fletcher, both petitioned Pope Leo XIII to re-found the shrine for Roman Catholics. This was done as the Lady Chapel in the Kings Lynn Mission Church, which still stands in London Road in Kings Lynn. And the chapel, or the Lady Chapel in that church, is a replica of the shrine in Loretto, as that is the closest we have to the shrine of the Annunciation, which Walsingham, uh, the mystery of the Annunciation is what Walsingham is all about. The, in 1897, Pope Leo XIII chose a statue, or a design for a statue, which was carved and sent to Kings Lynn, and it arrived there on August the 19th of that year and was enshrined in the new Lady Chapel of the Kings Lynn Church. And this was to become the shrine for Roman Catholics to Our Lady of Walsingham for the next 30 odd years. It wasn't until 1934 that the shrine moved from there to the Slipper Chapel, which is a mile and a half outside of Walsingham. At the reformation of the shrine in Kings Lynn, the day after the celebrations there, a group of about 50 people came to Walsingham by train, which you could do then, and walked out from the station to the Slipper Chapel. I should point out the Slipper Chapel was the last of the various wayside chapels that passed through England and that the pilgrims would visit on their way to the big shrine at Walsingham. The um, Slipper Chapel during the period from the Reformation through to the 1890s had become a farm building and was used as a buyer to keep cows in. It, at one point it was a workhouse and in the 1890s it was seen by a lady called Charlotte Pearson Boyd, and in 1906 she purchased the Slipper Chapel. She was an Anglican lady and spent her, she was quite a rich lady, and she spent her uh, money on restoring religious buildings. There's a convent still in, um, in uh, Kent that uh, she restored and it still has Anglican nuns in it. So she had a similar idea for the Slipper Chapel, but went on a retreat to the Monastery of Marid Sioux in Belgium, and there she was received into the Catholic Church. So she was in a dilemma. She was towards the end of the process of buying this chapel, but because her trust was so wrapped up in the Church of England, um, her trustees refused to pay the bill, so she paid for the Slipper Chapel out of her own pocket and bought the chapel and offered it to the Roman Catholic Diocese of Northampton, which was the diocese at that time that covered the Walsingham area. Um, for the last 35 years, we've been in the Diocese of East Anglia, which was cut off from Northampton to make a more manageable unit. Um, so at that time the Bishop of Northampton did not have a use for the chapel and it stood empty and eventually it was given to the monks of Downside Abbey 
downside being um, near Bath in Somerset, and they did nothing with the chapel for many years. But in 1934, um, Cardinal Francis Bourne, who was the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, decided that the Slipper Chapel should be Cardinal Bourne decided that the Slipper Chapel should become the national shrine in England for Roman Catholics of uh, the National Shrine of Our Lady. This happened and it was declared that on the 19th of August in 1934. Uh, there was a pilgrimage of about 10,000 people, we are told, and the Cardinal came, even though he was seriously ill at the time, and um, that was the beginning of modern-day Walsingham for Roman Catholics with their shrine in the Slipper Chapel. The King's Lynn Shrine remained, and it's now known as the Pontifical Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham, the Slipper Chapel being called the National Shrine. From that date in 1934, pilgrimages started to happen, and there were a couple of very noticeable ones, um, notable ones, and the major of these was in 1948, the, at the end of the Second World War, a group of Englishmen took part in a pilgrimage that went to Vézelay in France with carrying crosses from various places in Europe to Vaisley as a uh, pilgrimage of uh, reconciliation after the terrible acts of the war. The English group decided that the same should happen in England, and in 1947 they did a dummy run, just one cross was carried, and then in 1948, 14 crosses set out from various cathedrals and large parish churches around England, and they left their point of departure on the 2nd of July, and they all arrived in Walsingham on the evening of the 15th of July, so that they could then do the last leg into the shrine on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in uh, on the 16th of July, 1948. Those, once all the 14 crosses had arrived, each group had a mass in the Slipper Chapel, and there's a wonderful program which shows them having about 20 minutes only to say the mass. Yes, the, each, each group had a 20-minute slot for their mass in the Slipper Chapel, and then they all had a mass together with the um, Cardinal Archbishop of the time and processed with their crosses barefoot from the Slipper Chapel down into the village, into the priory grounds where the original shrine used to be. Then at the end of the afternoon, they then processed back to the Slipper Chapel and the crosses were erected around the uh, field that the Slipper Chapel stands in, and they became the devotion known as the Stations of the Cross, and they are still there to this day. It is, um, well, now there are so few of the carriers, the cross carriers let, remaining, but many of them have had their ashes buried at the foot of the cross that they carried, so they become a very um, poignant part of the Roman Catholic shrine today. Pilgrimages increased and in 1981 it was decided that um, a chapel needed uh, to be built because they could no longer accommodate the numbers of people. Um, in the, they had built an outside altar with various um, covers over the years but it was decided that to bite the bullet and build a chapel. And the Chapel of Our Lady of Reconciliation was built and it was consecrated in 1981 
by the Bishop of East Anglia, Bishop Clark. He chose to be buried beside the Slipper Chapel and his grave is there today and uh, many people come to visit his grave beside the Slipper Chapel that he loved so much. Other bishops have visited Walsingham, obviously, and about 10 years ago, we had a bishop, uh, a pilgrimage of the entire hierarchy of England. All the bishops of the various dioceses around England came with the seminarians that were in training, and that was the first time we had had so many bishops present, and there were about 24, I think, that day. So the, the Walsingham, as for Roman Catholics, is very much in the centre of their devotion to Our Lady. And the numbers increase as we, as we speak. Up until the current pandemic, we did have as many as somewhere like 150,000 to 200,000. It's hard to give a, uh, an exact number. But all of this was eclipsed very recently in that in um, sorry, very, 19, uh, 2018, we began a process which was called the Dowry of Mary Pilgrimage. And this meant that instead of people coming to Walsingham, Our Lady was taken out of the Slipper Chapel, the statue, and it was taken to every cathedral and a few other places um, around um, the, the English countryside. Our Lady is the Slipper Chapel, is the National Shrine for England. There is another in Wales, there is another in Scotland, so it's England. So it visited every cathedral in England and for a three day stay, and there were devotions and so on in all the cathedrals and then it came home prior to making its final visit to Westminster. Unfortunately, fate stepped in and the country went into complete and utter lockdown. So the ultimate aim of the, this pilgrimage was that England should be rededicated as the Diary of Mary. It was dedicated in the 14th century um, as Mary's dowry, and this was to be a rededication at, um, for the people of today. The, it was decided that we would go ahead with the rededication. And bearing in mind, had it been a natural event, we would have had at most 10,000 maybe, um, but on the day of the rededication, it was being streamed worldwide. It was being um, sent out by the um, EWTN, a big Catholic television network, and there were over 500,000 people present at the dedication, which took place in the empty chapel at Walsingham um, because we were in lockdown. We were not allowed um, services with people present. So it, it just happened with a few people in the chapel, but it had, it had this huge audience of about half a million people who joined in the rededication. So that was our biggest pilgrimage ever, um, even though it was a virtual pilgrimage. But we have noticed that since that day, the amount of interest in Walsingham has doubled, tripled, quadrupled. It, it's, it's colossal. We're getting hundreds of uh, contacts each day, people wanting to know about Walsingham, wanting to have prayers said for their intentions, or candles lit, and also um, having masses said for their intentions. And this is during this lockdown period, the streaming from the chapel, which happens 24 hours a day, has really taken off and um, 
it will be interesting to see what happens once people are allowed to come again in person, which we hope will be in another six months or so. But um, we have survived this pandemic period and are looking forward to welcoming people in uh, actual pilgrimages from perhaps Easter next year. All right, that was the talk by Tim. I just would like to add to that for those who might not be aware is that, of course, Roman Catholicism after the Reformation was very much suppressed in, in, in the United Kingdom. So that's why it was so important that they were recognized again. And it's amazing to see how now they are flourishing here again. And we can really also add that that's the mother of God at work in a total different way. But not everybody realizes maybe how much Roman Catholicism had to be underground in a way. So that, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to add. Well, I will now talk a little bit about the uh, beginnings of uh, Walsingham. Mother Malangeth, if you stop sharing your screen and I'll be able to share mine. So oh, can... ah, yes, I need to stop share. Forgive me. I launch ahead, stop share. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. But I can carry on talking now. All right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the beginnings of Walsingham as becoming a place of pilgrimage. The year that is used is 1061, that in a very small village, a Saxon village called Little Walsingham, there was a lady and she was a widow called uh, Richeldes de Faverge, and she was the lady of the local um, house, so to speak. And uh, the, and she was a very devout person and she prayed a lot and at some point during her prayer it seemed that she had a vision and in her vision or in her dream she was taken by the mother of God to Nazareth to the house where she heard the good news where the Archangel Gabriel visited her and she showed Lady Richelders very clearly the dimensions and impressed upon her to rebuild the house here in Walsingham where she lived. And she also said, added two things to that or more, but the two things that come out mostly is she said whoever comes to Walsingham and will pray here and in her holy house will always find succor and the second one is she said that near her house there always will be water so those are two things now Lady Richelle had this vision apparently three times and after that, she called the best of her craftsmen to start building this house and gave them the exact dimensions. But for some reason or another, according to the pins and ballads, they could not get the house together. In the end, it just didn't want to stand. In the end, she had to send them home. And then she prayed during the night very fervently to Our Lady. And behold, the next day when she went out to the fields, she found that the Holy House was erected, but not at the spot where they had originally tried, but about 300 yards away from it. And it stood there perfectly fit together. 
the craftsmen came and of course they wondered what had happened and they thought it was some double dealing and thinking, oh, we were sent home, we were not good enough. But look here, the house now stands. And obviously it became clear that nothing of the sort had happened, but that it was really a, mir a miracle how the house stood there. People questioned this, but that there was a real miracle involved is very clear because they never destroyed the house, but built a stone wall around it. And later time, when they started to build a priory, the house was never destroyed by the faithful. Of course, destruction came, but before that happened, Walsingham became a very important place of pilgrimage, and it took off rather quickly, and it had different royal visitors. And... Um, the last one to come was Henry VIII. He even returned to Walsingham to give thanks because he came to pray for a, an heir to the throne. Of course, a male child was born and he returned in thanksgiving, but the male child did not live very long. Then we had, uh, of course, also under Henry VIII, the whole dissolution of the monasteries and so forth and the priory that had sprung up around the holy house and that was manned by canons um, was, to, was destroyed. Uh, and the statue of Our Lady of Walsingham was taken to London, some say to Smithfield, where it was burned. And then, of course, it trickled down. But how important it was in tradition is the names that were given to Walsingham. It was Our Lady of the Sea, and there are many stories of fishermen or boats, people, pilgrims who try to come to Walsingham. We're only five miles from the coast, that they were maybe lost at sea and they prayed to Our Lady of Walsingham and they would and they found their way. To the to wells next to sea. So that's why you also will hear that she's called Star of the Sea here or Our Lady of the Sea. Um, it became known among the other important pilgrimage places for Western Europe. And I would stress this for our East European friends. Uh, it was about the only in the Middle Ages, big pilgrimage place dedicated to the Mother of God at that time. And it rang together with Jerusalem, Saint, Jacques de, Saint James of Compostello, and Rome, of course, as being the burial place of Saint Peter. So it's just how, that's how important Walsingham became. Um, then it all trickled down and then in the early of the 20th century, interest started to pick up. And you've heard Tim say a bit about the Oxford movement, the, the, the Age of Enlightenment. Also, there was lots more interest for East and West. And gradually, there was uh, Father Hope Patton. His first name is Hope. So it's Father Hope and his surname is Patton. Um, he became the parish priest here of St. Mary's Church. And he started to take an interest in the pilgrimages that had taken place. And he had a, a statue carved, which was placed in one of his side chapels in the church. His bishop thought that he had gone mad if you like he was not very keen the bishop but father hope against all the advice of his bishop went ahead and did it and out of that act has sprung up the new shrine to our lady of Walsingham here the original of course is totally destroyed the grounds are still there and there are some ruins to be seen and there is a plaque as where you can find 
where the Holy House stood. It's now in private hands. And Father Hope has found a plot of land just across a few hundred yards where he was able to rebuild when in the early 1930s. When he started to rebuild, also on the ins or the encouragement of Father Fines Clinton, who was at that time rector of um, St. Magnus the Martyr in London, Father Hope invited the Orthodox who lived in the area to take part in rebuilding the shrine. And Julie, um, one of the bishops, and I just have to look, um, Bishop Nestor of Kamchatka at the time, I think, or was it? No, for Archbishop Seraphim of the Rokor came from Paris to bless a parcel of land where it was envisaged by Father Hope to have an Orthodox chapel. He had a vision for it. And um, it didn't come to pass, but in the end, we have an Orthodox chapel in the Shrine Church. The interesting thing was when they started to dig for the foundations of the Holy House, which was the first thing to be built, the new Holy House, um, they found a well. And of course, they were overjoyed because of the prophecy of the Mother of God or the promise of the Mother of God to say that there will always be water near her house. So that's what happened. And then we have the Orthodox Chapel, which is on, which we call upstairs. At the moment, we can't access it because of the restrictions that are in place. But I have found that um, Father Nicholas Gibbs, who was the tutor to the family of the Tsar, and he came back, of course, with all the sad events. He came back to England where, and um, he had become Orthodox. And he has had quite a lot of input in forming the chapel. And he most likely designed the present iconostasis. And he donated a, a lamp, uh, the seven branched candle lamp, um, for the, which is on the altar. I'm unfortunately, I've not been able to take a picture of it, so I can't show it to you. And there were quite a lot of people in the area, a lot of Orthodox people because of the camps that were here and because of the forced labor people. So in other words, prisoners who lived in the area. And that also explained why Father Hope Patson was able to involve the Orthodox with restoring, so to speak, rebuilding a shrine to, to the mother of God. Um, it's very interesting that uh, Prince Vladimir Galitsina was invited to become an honorary guardian, which he accepted. His sister, who lived now, who recently lived in Mettingham, where Father Deacon Bond is, he was married to, uh, sorry, his, uh, his, I think it was his niece, I do apologize, his niece, um, Mary Bond Galitsina. They founded an Orthodox church there, and it's specifically Mary and Father Andrew together, but specifically Mary who, who founded an Orthodox church in Mettingham. And I thought it's an interesting connection to see. Um, I'm not sure. There, and well, then, there was a priest, a Serbian priest, who was here to minister to the faithful who came regularly to the shrine uh, for worship. And also in 1946, um, Bishop Nikolai Vjelimirovic, the 
the Serbian bishop, who later has become saint, had lived here for about two months, November and December, in the college and served several liturgies, obviously, during his time. He came here after he um, was let free from the Dachau concentration camp and before he set sail to America. Um, the Serbian priest, Miodrach Naidorovic, stayed here until such times that gradually the displaced people disappeared, so to speak. They maybe went back to their home countries. And in the end, in the early 50s, Father Meldrach went to serve in a parish in Derby. But then for some time, the chapel was not served particular, by one particular Orthodox priest, though lots of pilgrimages took place, mainly uh, encouraged by Bishop Vitali and Bishop Nicodine. And they were also helping to establish the Orthodox Fellowship of Our Lady of Walsingham, which came under the auspices in the end of Metropolitan Athanagoras. And there was also the Greeks who came a lot, Bishop Christopher of Telmesos, led very led quite a lot of pilgrimages to Walsingham for the Orthodox to come. And then in the late 60s, 1968, the Anglican shrine administrator asked the Orthodox community to please send a priest again as a shrine priest to administer the chapel, which happened. And Father David or David Myrick and uh, Leon Lidemont came to Walsingham. They were icon painters and they started a brotherhood of Saint Seraphim. They could not afford a lot of lodgings for to pay and they found that the railway station, which had become obsolete in the cuts of the railway lines here in Britain, um, and they could afford the rent of the railway station. They very quickly converted the railway station into a chapel, which you can see, and it became the church and, um, and they, um, well, they worshiped there and started their icon painting there. When it was open, of course, people started to visit and many people talked and so forth. So they found to be at St. Seraphim's was not very conducive for producing icons because you have to be, in a way, you, you're concentrated obviously a lot and um, you, you can't constantly interrupt your work to talk to people, but that's of course the main thing is your hospitality. So they moved out to Dunton, and in 1979, Mother Sarah Fimaj was also, also came to Walsingham and she was a member of the Brotherhood of St. Seraphim. Um, but during that time in the late 70s, Father David, or David Myrick, as he was at the time, he, oh no, he was father, sorry, I get it mixed up, do forgive me. Um, he found that the, but in Rokor became a little bit too restricted at that time. There was a period in time where Rokor went through a difficult time and father uh, David asked to to come under Metropolitan Anthony of Suros, and they became part of the Suros Diocese. And Vladik Anthony came in 1980 and served a liturgy at St. Seraphim's and made Father David a monk. And that's how monastic life started a bit further from Mother Seraphima, apart from Mother Seraphima having been there. 
1983, uh, Vladika Anthony led a diocesan pilgrimage to Walsingham, and he served the liturgy in the Shrine Church on the High Altar at the time, as far as I understand. The community, the monastic community, started flourishing and it attracted a lot of people. And as it was rented accommodation, the people who came there, they wanted to have a more permanent, a more sure house to play in. And in 1986, there was the, there was in Great Walsingham, there was an obsolete chapel of the Methodist available. And they bought that and they started to transform that into an Orthodox church. And in 1988, it was consecrated as such. Um, you can't tell from the outside and people who see the, the church from the outside, the Church of the Holy Transfiguration, they are stunned when they go in to find such a transformation. And there were for a while, for about five years, services took place in both the Holy Transfiguration and at St. Seraphim's. The Holy Transfiguration as a parish church, usually at the weekends, and at St. Seraphim's they followed the daily pattern of worship maintained by Father David and Mother Seraphima. Uh, Father David became ill, and in the early 90s, they had to stop this, they had to discontinue, so the parish church took over. And in 1993, Father David, who had become Archimandrite David by that time, sadly died because he suffered leukemia, which we know is blood cancer. In 1996, Mother Serafima was recalled to London, where she then served at a cathedral in London for until her death in 2008, I think. I think she died in 2008. And it seems um, of course, that monastic life had come to an end, but it hasn't. In the early 2000s, there was a monk came to Walsingham. He maybe did not come originally as a monk, but he became a monk by the name of Peter. He became a hierodeacon and he left Walsingham in the beginning of 2012. But by that time, and he served for a while in uh, St. Seraphim's where he read services, but I think he stopped that at about 2008. Um, I arrived in Walsingham in 2009 and initially I was requested to come to Walsingham. And initially I was asked to help out at St. Seraphim's, which I did. I helped with Manning, they had a little shop. I helped in cleaning the church and I also read Vespers there regularly. Uh, Leon Lidemond was still alive by, at that time. He was still painting icons in a workshop in Walsingham, but he sadly died in 2010. Uh, Saint Seraphim's has become now a pilgrimage chapel and it is a railway museum and they have a quiet garden and that in a way and it's still open I don't know now with the restrictions it is closed but it is open to pilgrims on the whole all the year round that people can go in and play and light candles and I think at least once a year there is a divine liturgy served for St. Seraphim in the summer. Um, and uh, occasionally that pilgrims who come, groups of pilgrims, and they might have a liturgy, divine liturgy there at St. Seraphim's. Um, at the moment, I'm the person who carries on the, the Orthodox monastic presence. 
I lived in a very, originally in a very, very tiny cottage of about five by six meters in which I did everything. I slept, I cooked, I ate, I prayed, and I worked in there. I did everything and I had a corner for everything. So, but it, it, in the end, it got at me, it became too small. I lived in, literally in an archway and it was very dark. I could not see the sky. I had to go to one window, stand in the window and look up to see the sky. It's a little bit of a personal note. But after a few years, um, where I live now became available. And when I was told that there was a place for me to live, I, I was in shock, in literally shock. I could not believe that there would be a place bigger than what I had for me to live. And the person who told me couldn't understand. I, was, I had turned white when I heard the news and my voice came out of my toes because I was asked if I was all right. And I said something like, yes. But uh, it took me months to get used to the idea that I could live in a bigger place. And I've lived here now in the, where I am now, the Skeet Cairo. Um, it's, um, I've lived here now for seven years, I think, almost eight years. And I still can't believe that I really am living here. It is very airy, light with windows, and it's lovely. Um, it was very interesting that the news, I heard the news on the I follow the Julian calendar, so it's on the 1st of May on the Julian calendar, which is the 14th of May on the civil calendar, and which is dedicated to the icon of the Mother of God of unexpected joy, and it couldn't have been more appropriate, obviously. I, it was very unexpected. Um, when I visited the Flats. They call it a flat. It's more like a house in a way, but in England they call it a flat. Um, when I visited it for the second time before I moved in, in the hallway there was a big plaque saying 38A, which is the street number, and under it some strange letters, XAIPW. And nobody could make sense of it, so I look at it. Because the workman asked me, said, well, it's a very strange plug, because I saw it and I started to smile and giggle. And they said, what is it? What? It's very strange. I said, no, it means chairo. It's a Greek word for to rejoice or I rejoice or welcome. And they said, oh, you know Greek? I said, only a little. So they were very intrigued by this. But of course, to me, it added only to the joy of being in Walsingham. And uh, they insisted that they would paint it and make it beautiful to put it on the door, which I thought was very, very nice of them. Um, there are many stories we can tell about Walsingham. Walsingham is also known for its miracles. I think at some point you will have seen little wooden tiles in the slideshow and those are all thanksgivings of people in the Anglican shrine um, who have been healed by the mother of God and uh, so it's just a witness to the healings. There is a very interesting story about King Edward I uh, who visited Walsingham and he was playing chess in one of the inns, which was called Checkers. And while he was playing chess there, he had a very strong impression that he had to get up and move away from his place. He did so, and 
very quickly after that, when he had moved away, the vaulted ceiling came down and he always thanked the mother of God to save him from a certain death. Uh, another one more in recent times is when I myself was working in the shrine, I had two people, two old ladies who had come and they wanted holy water. But the big uh, fat, the big bucket, I would say, we keep there with a little tap was empty and they couldn't get it. So I was fetched to provide some. So I did and I started talking to them and helped them to fill up their bottles. And one of the old ladies said to me, oh, well, you know, it really works. I said, what do you mean it really works? Oh, you know, this holy water, it really works. And they told the story that when she was young, her mother had died and she was together with her sister. The doctor had come to pronounce her mother dead and she and her sister were of course very sad and they looked at each other and they looked at the corner in the room where they kept holy water of Walsingham and they both understood what they wanted to do and they sprinkled Mama with the holy water of Walsingham and her eyes fluttered after that. The priest said, oh, well, that was imagination. You know, she's really dead, she's really dead. But lo and behold, her mother lived. So there is a story of resurrection that the holy village or that Walsingham is a holy village um, I can share a story that was told to me, and that was uh, two of our faithful came to Walsingham by taxi. They lived in one of the surrounding villages on a Sunday morning. The taxi driver who drove them had never been to Walsingham, and he drove in and came into the village and said, what is this village about? What is here? It's very different here. And the, those two parishioners were very surprised and said, well, of course, it's dedicated to the mother of God, Our Lady of Walsingham. This taxi driver, though he was reasonable local, had no idea about it. And he, of course, had to investigate. But there we are, someone coming in totally strange, saying there's something so different about this village. I think for now I have said enough. I could go on and on and on talking because there's so many things to I could share, but maybe I should just go quiet and um, if that's all right. Mother Melanga, if you want to share one of your final videos, um, we've, we've We've spent a little more time on your talk than we expected. So would you I like to share know. one of your final videos now? Is that that's your song? Is that all right? If you must. <laughs> yes, but I don't know. What do I do now? Oh, I have to do share screen yes. again. Yes. Um, while you do that, I'll just explain to people um, uh, that I went to Walsingham with um, some friends from the Fellowship of St. John the Baptist. Um, a few years ago and was inspired to write a poem and it was only after I had written the whole thing that I realised it was in the rhythm or metre of Agni Parthene um, and I am in no way comparing myself to Saint Nectarios but um, I have sung it to that melody um, and sent Mother Malanga the recording so that she can play that now with some images of the village of Walsingham. In Walsingham, where light and love are intermingled from above, rejoice, O unwedded bride. 
where pilgrims know their prayers to bring and raise their hearts in praise and sing rejoice so unwedded bride in england's nazareth they find the peace that soothes the troubled mind rejoice so unwedded bride in unassuming village small they lift their song both one and all rejoice so unwedded bride in glorious day and peaceful night the pilgrims are in merry sight rejoice so unwedded bride their hearts to heaven they do fly and with the angels do they cry rejoice so unwedded bride the pilgrims visit churches fair rejoice in fellowship so rare rejoice so unwedded bride through oft trod streets and ancient ways sing archathists and psalms of praise rejoice o unwedded bride the theotokos they do meet in every lane and every street rejoice o unwedded bride both pilgrims past and present day to thank the lord for grace and say rejoice o unwedded bride when to the world they must return the pilgrims still have much to learn rejoice o unwedded bride their hearts for waltzing um, do long but earth resounds with merry song rejoice o unwedded bride Thank you, Mother Melangeth. Um, oh, if, if you perhaps uh, stop sharing your screen, so we we just have have you on the screen now. All right. I what do I do? Oh yes, I do here. That's All right. right. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful introduction to Walsingham for those who may be new to it. But also, I'm sure there were details in things that you said that were new to many people. Um, I, I wondered whether I could start the questions um, myself, if I may, and ask you a little about your own journey to Walsingham. Um, you've told us about the miracle the Mother of God worked in, in getting you the Skeet House, uh, but I wonder about whether you could say something about how you found Walsingham and came to live there. Um, it's, well, it's a bit of a... I, I don't know where to start. I think it was the, um, it, I think in 1999, I think I visited Walsingham with friends, two friends from London. And um, it was, I found it very interesting and liked it very much. But that was it. I uh, didn't think much of was a monastery, so I didn't think much. A few years later, when I was in the monastery in France, I had to come back to England for some medical treatment. And uh, in that time that I spent in England, I visited Wales and I did walk around there, I had some good long walks and I went into a small local church and I can't remember exactly what the name is. I can't remember the saint's name. And I do remember that I prayed there and asked, well, where will I be in the end? Because I knew the monastery where I was, that I wouldn't be there forever. It's some inkling, you can't explain why 
one thinks that not because I was looking like, oh, I want to run, but I just wondered what would happen to me. And I had a very clear answer that I would be in Walsingham. And I thought, well, we will see that, you know, through such a small village. And it seemed so improbable because I was in France. I didn't really think I would move away from that at all. Though I, deep down, I thought I maybe will move from here. Anyway, cut a long story short, that was one thing. Um, all the places I've been during so far, during my monastic life, I haven't done by choice, but really following obedience and following Christ. And that's where my stability is. It is in Christ and nowhere else. And um, in the end, I came back to England in 2009 and I was with Bishop Bessel and he asked me to go and have a look at Walsingham. I didn't think much of it and I had to go and visit. I didn't have two pennies to rub together, but I happened to have a meeting with a friend, a long-standing friend that I've known since the 1970s, so I can say long-standing friend. And uh, we had met up for a coffee, had a good talk to catch up, and then we both would go back our ways and we walked past one of the banks, eh, nothing untoward in London, and she said, oh, I just have to draw out some money. She pulled out money, she took the money out of this tap, <laughs> And she turned to me and gave it to me and she said, no objections, please, but this is for you. I feel you really need this money. And I couldn't refuse whatever I did, it didn't work. And the money she gave me was exactly enough to make a journey to Walsingham and to spend uh, a night here or two nights. I can't remember what I did. And, uh, but it was exactly enough for me to have a look at Walsingham. So I had a look, I went back to Bishop Bessel and he asked me what I thought. And I said, well, it's like a huge cross looming over me, you know, a bit discouraged. And Bishop Bessel was very good. He could really give answers that punched you and that you'll never forget. And he said, well, if there is no cross, that it wouldn't be worth it, would it? So that was that. I came to Walsingham. I lived in this tiny cottage and um, there we are. I thought I had to leave Walsingham because I couldn't cope in the end in that little cottage. It was too much. But the mother of God has worked miracles. I. Very soon after my arrival, I found employment, which meant I could foresee in my own needs, which you need to do. And I found employment in the Anglican shrine, and I served there for 10 years. But at some point I thought I had to leave because the cottage was too small. And then of course, this skit, this house, Cairo, became available, and now I live here. And I mean, the Mother of God has not forgotten us. She has visited Walsingham uh, in my time four times in different ways, twice under the guise of the Kursk root icon, and both times it came to my skit. First in the little cottage where I lived and the second time in the skit. The miracle working and the mer streaming icon of the mother of God of Hawaii came to Walsingham and also visited my skit. So she really encouraged me to, to keep going. And then we also had under the flag of the pro-life movement, the mother of God of Czechoslovakia, and she started in Vladivostok at the east coast of Russia, 
and she traveled all over Russia, all over Europe, and miraculously came to Britain. I was in the slipper chapel or in the Roman Catholic shrine where she was brought. And, um, and they had, we were asked to come and sing, a, I think, Akathist, if I remember correctly. I can't remember exactly, but that's a most beautiful icon, the mother of God of Czechoslovakia, and I've got a history with her as well. It seems the mother of God has popped up in my life, as many people will witness for themselves. I think if everybody tells, I'm sure that everybody has met a mother of God at some point in their life. So I'm not thinking I'm unique or that it's so special to me, but it's just a witness that indeed she works all those things. And I heard when I was in the Catholic shrine, I happened to sit unbeknown to me. I had a gentleman sitting next to me and afterwards we started to talk and he was the big organizer of the whole thing, which I had no idea. But he told me that they had great difficulty in getting the icon across the channel. They did not want to know. The news media did not want to know about it and it didn't receive any highlight in the news that this icon was coming. But it came and it made a whole way to England over the motorways. And I think that's another witness what miracles the mother of God really does do. There we are. I wonder um, whether you could give some advice to people who when the pandemic restrictions are lifted would like to come and visit Walsingham it's it's one of those places in England that people think are impossible but it's almost impossible to get there by public transport you can just about but almost impossible and um, it's uh, sort of very remote it has a very remote feeling despite being not very far from cities like Kings Lynn or, or Norwich um, but it's a very village feeling and um, difficult to get to so I wonder whether you can suggest to people the best time to come things that they might uh, encounter um, whether good or bad um, and and Yes, and perhaps what might happen if they visit your skeet, for example? Well, I would say, of course, we are out in the sticks. Walsingham is very unique. The surroundings is that it is hilly, whereas most of Norfolk is flat. It has got a microculture in itself. So sometimes we have lots of snow here and the surrounding area has nothing. Or the reverse, we have no snow and the surrounding area is covered. So it's just to give an idea. Um, the best time to come is when you feel the mother of God is prompting you to come or when you can come. During the winter though, it's more difficult because of the roads and uh, icy conditions. The Anglican shrine in normal times also have a closure period in winter over December and early January before they reopen because they do their big clean during that time. The Catholic shrine is similar. They both have accommodation. So if you want to come, I would say uh, I've given Margaret uh, contact details, contact me and then we can see what's what. There are of course special times in the year that it's maybe very nice to come and that is, for example, um, the feast during Bright Week, uh, the feast of the life-giving spring, which is kept as a feast day for the Orthodox Shrine Chapel. Uh, it originally, the Shrine Chapel, I must say, was dedicated to the Mother of God of Perpetual Succor, which of course was very appropriate because that was her promise. But to also have the wellspring, of course, is very appropriate too because of the well that is there at the Holy House. So there are that. Um, my, uh, for my skeet, myself, I, we keep 
the 1st of May, which is 14th of May on the civil calendar, the unexpected joy icon, it's the summer feast of the skeet. The winter feast is on the 22nd of December or the 9th of December uh, on the Julian calendar, which is the conception of the mother of God. So um, those are dates, but I find it very difficult to say to people come at such and such time. Uh, it's very difficult when there is the Anglican uh, the national pilgrimage because the accommodation will be fully booked, mm -hmm. booked out. But if people want to come, they need to anticipate really that on the whole, well in advance, especially during the warmer months, the summer months, because the accommodation is taken. Of course, with the present restrictions, we don't know how it will go, but uh, there we are. And of course, uh, people can come alone, people can come in small groups, they can organize a parish pilgrimage, a bigger pilgrimage, whatever. As long as it's planned in advance, a lot of things can be accommodated. And the skeet here I maintain regular services. Now that the uh, Shrine Chapel is not accessible for us because of the restrictions, um, we celebrate the offices here in the ski chapel and on Saturdays and Sundays on the whole and for big feast days during the week. Obviously, I maintain uh, services during the week, matins and vespers, matins at six in the morning and vespers at six in the evening. So very simple schedule. Yes, and I, I encourage people to go and visit um, at any time of year. I've had a wonderful time there in quite a cold October, but it was um, because it was October, it was easier to get accommodation and um, it was quiet in the village. And so it was it was just a wonderful experience. The Bulashoff family have commented, it is worth the trip and one visit isn't enough. And I'd agree with that. Oh, oh yes, no, no, no. I mean, I walk back into the shrine church and into the holy house and it's just marvellous. I can't explain it. But of course, it's the village. Every time when I've been to the market in Fakenham, which is five miles south of here, um, and I come back and we start to enter to the road of Walsingham, my heart always jumps and I can't explain it. And I always think, oh, we're almost there now. I know we're almost there. And other people have had the same experience. So it's, again, not unique to me. It's a shared experience by people. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, David <laughs> has said that, um, I, think, I think this was mentioned, but that Walsingham is known as England's Nazareth. Yes, um, and uh, it might just be worth explaining about the Holy House. So the Holy House is within the Shrine Church. Yes, it's a house within the house. You will have seen pictures of it. Um, I don't know if I should go back to it. It's a house within the house. And obviously the original Shrine Church was tiny. It was just like a brick wall around the Holy House that was built. The Holy House was the house where the mother of God received the news of the Archangel Gabriel and that was rebuilt. And uh, then Father Hope Patton rebuilt that on its present place now. And then the shrine church got extended in 1938 to its present form, more or less. And because of the Holy House originally stood in Nazareth. Little Walsingham is now called England's Nazareth. There is a medieval ballad by Pinson, which is very well known. I can't sing it, so I didn't dare to, <laughs> to bring it up too much, but it gives a lot of history of, um, of the of Walsingham and uh, he points to it that also it was called Mary's Dowry 
and that's where the Catholic gets it from to rededicate it, the rededication to Mary, to rededicate uh, Walsingham as Mary's dowry. So I hope that that explains a bit. Yes, and I just that's the holy house. Yes. And for those who listen from our archdiocese, a lamp on the right in the holy house, the hanging lamps, one of the lamps is dedicated to the archdiocese as intercession. Right, thank you. Um, we've just had a message from um, Miriam from yes. uh, St. Ephraim, the Syrian parish in Cambridge. She says, yes. God willing, we're hoping to make a parish pilgrimage during the feast of the life-giving spring, if the pandemic has ceased with Father Raphael Armour. And we have a booking at Elm Elmham Hall, the Catholic shrine. Yes. So oh, if people, I will write it down. <laughs> Very good. If people are able to join yes. us even for the day or, or to get accommodation. Yes. So this yes. is the, the Friday after Pascha. Yes, I maybe should say that, that Father Raphael from the Cambridge Parish at the moment is the shrine priest for the Orthodox Chapel. Father Philip Steer has been the priest before him, but Father Philip Steer had to retire because of health, of his health. I think people know that, but of course we do miss him and we are very grateful for all that was in place. But of course, this um, plague has eclipsed a lot of our patterns of worship. Indeed. Um, I'm going to share, since we're nearly at the end of our time, I'm going to share again the link for donating to our charities, which um, we are uh, um, supporting through this but I wonder um, Mother Melangath if you wanted to just play the final conduct that you had intended to in yes I do have to do share screen again yes I do or, that or I can do it if you prefer I have oh no I think you need to do this one because mm -hmm. you can't you couldn't do it yes. I do it I will go back um Let me just start somewhere else. Hopefully that will work. Um, where is it? Oh, here. Thou who art favoured by God, grant unto me from out of thy wellspring which never becomes empty. There continue us running waters of thy kindness that is beyond description. For since thou didst bear the word who is far above all understanding, I beseech thee to drench me with thy grace, so that I may cry unto thee, hell wholesome water. I just will let this play to the end, if that's all right. And that's fine. Um, while, while that um, plays in the background, let me thank Mother Melangeth again um, on behalf of you all. It's been really lovely to have a very personal um, connection given to us um, all about Walsingham and the Mother of God. Um, and I hope that you have enjoyed this evening. We have one final virtual visit next Monday, that's the 4th of January, um, and that will be on St. Seraphim of Sarov. Now, of course, one of the churches in Little Walsingham is dedicated to St. Seraphim. The Brotherhood based there was um, the Brotherhood of St. Seraphim. So we have another link through our um, virtual visits, which I think is a great blessing. I hope you um, all have a lovely remainder of the um, uh, feast of the, um, for both new calendar and uh, old style calendar. And 
we will hopefully see you next week and if not the recordings will be online thank you for joining us if you want to give everyone a wave now is your opportunity i will stop sharing so you can see each other <laughs> Okay, so we'll, I'll go on to gallery view very briefly and everyone can wave. Wonderful. Lovely to see you all and hopefully see you next Monday. Thank you, Mother Malanga. Thank you.